Like she can show an app, stick it out, stick it out, poke it out, yeah, stick it out, poke it out, yeah. Turn around, I wanna see. Do it look like how I look on IG? Bad from every angle, she got herself a trainer. I know that can't help but take a little peek. Uh. Cold world and full lar and co-star and we both flexing, both Jacksons, both guard and these cap that rap with piss po jargon. My latest whip, my latest chick was both foreign. I know all my hoes miss me. I've been a since I hit elementary. She know who run it, the one that keep it hunted. To find a better shit, you gon' have to live a century. Evidently, the coach can't bench me. The franchise player, I don't know how to miss, and they can't buy a layup. I'm anti what they are. I can't take my eyes off your pants, I swear. Girl, you shining like a diamond clear. I'm thinking we should dip like the camera in air. If you the big step, I'm the landmine here. That's the one they know they can't come near. I just wanna see if you gon' lie, you gon' love me. I was getting bras way before I got the money. Honey, since I've been a star, they don't love me. The ceiling got stars when the star got no ceiling. Stick it out, stick it out, poke it out, poke it out, stick it out, stick it out, poke it out. Poke it out. Yeah, yeah, she got a little bus, so what? Uh, big bag, she can show enough. Stick it out, stick it out, poke it out, poke it out, stick it out, stick it out, poke it out. Poke it out. Poke it out. Yeah, blessings we are reap and we coerce in our handful. Oh, we not rise and boast. Yeah, we give thanks like we need it the most. We have to give thanks like we really supposed to be thankful. Blessings all for me. Hello, everyone. How's everyone feeling? Good, I hope. We're so excited to have you all here and get this party started. Um, welcome to Rhythm and Resistance, a Black History Month conversation hosted by 72 and Sunny. 72 and Sunny is a creative agency dedicated to unlocking possibilities through our commitment to expanding and diversifying the creative class. Um, today's conversation is an exploration of how Black music elevates our community's sense of joy, and we're also excited to commemorate 50 years of hip-hop with a few special guests that y'all should see pin, uh, pin to your screen. Um, and not only are we diving into our past and present, but we're also going to be covering our future. And one of the ways we'll be doing that, in addition to this conversation, is by investing in it. Um, what I'm going to share right now is a QR code for you all to donate to Brighter Choice Community School, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it once I show you what they are all about. All right. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yes, perfect. All right, you don't. So um, without further ado, so just to let you all learn a little bit, just so all you, so <laughs> just so that you all can learn a little bit more about Brighter Choice Elementary School. So um, 
really quickly here. So it's a public school that is his, it's located in a historically black neighborhood of Bed-Stuy. Bed um, it is a vibrant community that has also been known for its significant black cultural productions, most notably cultivating hip hop artists such as Little Kim, Biggie Smalls and Jay-Z. Um, they also exist within this cultural and musical legacy by tapping into music for students through performances, dances, mm -hmm. and instrument instructions. Um, Brighter Trist Community School exists within this cultural legacy by tapping, I'm sorry, uh, and instruction. So please go ahead and scan the QR code to go ahead and donate. Um, and then you can also learn about mo learn more about how they are developing the youth of tomorrow. Um, I'll allow you all about one minute to take a look and get there. And then I will continue with introducing our moderator. All right. Um, thumbs up if you all can see the QR code on the screen. Amazing. Okay, dope. So while you all are finishing up doing what you do there, I would like to go ahead and share a little bit about our superstar who will be leading our conversation today. Uh, she goes by the name of Makisha Noel. Uh, she's a proud Haitian American and Miami native. Um, she is also a global marketing executive at Razorfish. She touches Samsung and MasterCard. Before then, she most recently worked in strategy with Ogilvy, having clients such as Ikea, Dove, Merck, and new businesses, in addition to working with the diversity, equity, and inclusion team. Other clients she's touched have been Google, Capital One, Cafe, Apple, and Coca-Cola, um, and others. She's obviously very talented. Outside of marketing and advertise outside of the marketing and advertising industry, Makisha has built a community of black and brown women uh, through a collective called the Creative Culture Tribe. And it fosters dialogue around social issues with the Living Room Project. Makisha is also an MC and on-air talent that brings joy to every set and stage that she stands on. So tune in. Makisha recently launched, tune in, sorry, is a pod, uh, so sorry, tune in. <laughs> Makisha recently launched her solo podcast, On the Move with Maki, designed to tell the intimate stories of Black and Brown creators, movers, and shakers. Makisha is also a strategic creative leader and a rising force in media. So without further ado, let's go ahead and have Makisha take over um, as she leads us through this amazing conversation in all things joy, hip hop, and resistance. Yes. How is everyone doing? I know this is not an in-person crowd, but literally every time I moderate or host an event, I have to bring the energy to the stage. Like Sequania said, I really appreciate you making that introduction. Thank you, Sequania. Thank you for Brittany for this opportunity to be trusted to guide this conversation where we will be centering Black joy, Black music, all the things during Black History Month. So I want to start by having the panelists introduce themselves, but I also want you to go into the chat and let me know where you're from. There is no way that we could start any Black event, let's give it a buck, Black event without knowing where is everyone from. I'm in Miami. I'm in Miami, about to be multi-city, Miami to Texas. Let's go. And also on my Haitians, y'all can stand up. I'm going to shout everybody out. But let me know where you're from, where you're at, um, as we go into the introductions of the panelists. I see LA. Oh, y'all should never gave me this mic. I see LA. I see Brooklyn. I see Fort Lauderdale. Let's go. Texas, Houston, Austin, Miami. Oh, my gosh. I love it. I see the Haitian flags in the group. Yes. Okay. 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 Sacramento, Bronx, 
All right, ATL Utah, hey. welcome to the chat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and dive into it. What I'm going to have panelists do is say their name, their pronouns, and what their profession as well. I love for you to give a little tidbit about yourself before we jump into the ice warmer. And then we're going to jump into the conversation for this afternoon. And then we are going to wrap it up with the future outlook when it comes to exploring Black music and Black joy and the rhythm of resistance. All right. So I'm going to have my first panelist start DJ Artistic. Give it to us. What's good? I am DJ Artistic. I'm a DJ who is born and raised in Los Angeles between Inglewood, Gardena, and South Central. Um, I went to FAMU, so I saw everybody from Miami in the uh, chat. Woo! What's good, Miami? Because they're a half of FAMU. So I've oh, been absolutely. DJing. Yeah, they they ran it. So I've been uh, I've been DJing for about 16 years now. Before that, I was a producer and a and a rapper way, way, way back in the day. And uh, I'm always traveling, DJing. I was just in DC. I saw somebody representing DC in the building. So I was just out there. It was too cold for me, so I had to come right back. But that's um, that's about it for me. So appreciate you for having me. Yes, thank you for being here. Let's jump to Gabrielle. Yes, what's up? My name is Gabrielle. I'm also known as DJ Love G. I'm from Atlanta. So I saw a couple of people say Atlanta. Um, yeah, I was raised in Atlanta, born in Texas. I spent a lot of time in LA. So uh, LA was definitely pivotal for me for my DJ career. Um, and yeah, I am a DJ and I work in music marketing as well. I'm happy to be here. Yes, I love it. And then Zane, talk to us. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Zane Durham, he, him, his. Uh, I am a music producer, but also right now creative working in music marketing. So based out of Brooklyn, New York, right now I am in Atlanta also, just, you know, for the vibes and the, and the pink, as you can see. But um, yeah, I'm happy to be here and be a part of this conversation. Yes, I love it. So thank you so much for introducing yourselves. I want everyone to know as you're listening to the conversation and as you're tapping in with my amazing panelists, know that you can also ask questions in the group chat. So there is going to be a portion where you have an opportunity to talk to the panelists as well. I want you to keep those in mind throughout the conversation. So let's go ahead and start off with the ice to warmer as we know we're here to celebrate black music and black joy. So my question for the panelists are, what are some of your earliest memories of music and how has music been a facilitator of joy for you? And while you think about, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so being Haitian American, growing up in a Haitian household, I went to a Haitian church. And so for my Haitians in the chat, um, if you're familiar with Louange, Louange means a worship music in Creole. And so I grew up listening to Haitian worship, which was sometimes very similar to Haitian compa, like the music you listen to when you go to a club. Um, so it was very similar. But then I also had the best of both worlds where I and my brothers were like watching music videos on my grandpa's TV. So I remember Trina, whoop, whoop, below with that, too fat. And I'm like, no. Early, okay, okay. <laughs> it's fact, that's the truth that's what I grew up on and that was my yeah. earliest memories of music which really instilled a lot of confidence in me so I want to hear from y'all what are your earliest memories of music uh when y'all start Zane go ahead yeah. oh yeah everyone's yeah. gonna go for uh, this one yeah. Yeah. similar similar uh story I mean I think Sunday is, is the day where everybody's mom is gonna wake them up make sure you clean the house but before that you know your mom has to get her spirit right so she's gonna put on her music um, and once you hear that music, you know, it was time to wake up. It was time to get get the day going. So I think um, definitely Lovers Rock on a Sunday, Sunday morning is like the earliest thing that I can remember. Um, yes, bears him uh, ringing throughout the apartment uh, as you wake up. And then, I mean, I know it doesn't exist anymore, but 106 in Park, I think coming back, you know, those those old school shows were, were kind of the, the, the pillar of like, what was hot in music. So yeah, those are my earliest moments. Uh, for me, I would say, so um, going back to when I was a kid, like my dad claims that back when my mom was pregnant with me, that whenever he played drums, he was a drummer. So whenever he played the drum, I would jump inside my mom's stomach. So I don't remember those days, but that's what he claims <laughs> happened. So I'll take his word for it. But I feel like, because I came in, I came from a musical family. So 
my dad was a drummer, my mom was in the choir. So of course, just being in church every Sunday and hearing the songs that they're playing in there, and just being a kid and listening to the radio with them, they're always playing like 94.7 The Wave in LA. Uh, they didn't really play too much like Motown era, but definitely a lot of jazz. My dad was a jazz head. So I remember even mm. being in studios with people like George Duke and, and Dougal Chancellor back in the day. And um, right. and one, yeah, one memory I have in Dougal, um, I didn't realize who he was until I was older because he was just my dad's friend, but he had all, all this Michael Jackson stuff around his house. And I realized that he was a drummer on Billie Jean and uh, PYT, but I, I didn't realize it. I just thought he was a Michael Jackson fan like the rest of us. So I remember hearing those songs all the time as a kid and not even making that connection back then. So that's some of my earlier memories, I would say. Yes. Yeah, I think my earlier memories are like definitely just being in the car, like riding with my mom and like my Nana and like my Nana is a huge jazz fan. So anytime I was riding with my Nana, we were listening to jazz. And when I was with my mom, it kind of like traded off. Like my mom would like listen to like a lot of old school music. So like, you know, the Gap Band, Anita Baker, Sade, like those were like my foundations. Um, But then, you know, my aunt... I think my whole family is like involved in the music industry at some point. So like my aunt worked for a record label in Atlanta. So she was definitely playing like all the hip hop and rap from the nineties that like, you know, my mom was trying to hide me from and I would just, end up yeah. listening to it anyway riding in the car with my my aunt um my dad is also a dj so yeah i just feel like it's like all music has always kind of just been a part of like my childhood and my foundation and then as i've gotten older it's just been kind of been like very therapeutic like whenever i'm going mm-hmm. through something like listening to playlists whether i'm happy i'm sad um especially djing like dj is like very much like of a flow state for me so like whenever i start djing i just kind of like go into a different zone so it's very relaxing for me yes I, I I love how music has influenced literally every single part of your lives I can okay. hear I think that's so beautiful right and so I, I definitely want to start off this conversation with talking about the historical part of it right so I would like to hear from you all how have African-American spiritual gospel as we talked about a lot folk music hip-hop and rap been used to express struggle, hope, and solidarity in the face of racial oppression through history. So we know, remember, this conversation is going to be centered around Black joy, but I think it's important to recognize the historical references as well. So um, DJ Artistic, you can go ahead and start off with this one, and then everyone is going to get their individual questions as well. Yeah, I feel like basically the thing about music is that it's always reflected the times within every single decade. So going back to even before we had recorded music, of course we had everything from the weight in the water and the the hymnals we had back in those days. And then I would say, uh, especially around the sixties is when there was a a lot of consciousness uh, in there. So sixties and seventies, when there was a civil rights uh, era, I feel like a lot of music reflected that. So whether you had the seventies Marvin Gaye type songs, uh, Stevie Wonder had his as well. Curtis Mayfield had his, I feel like it was a direct, reflection of what we were going through, but it was always with a a positive outlook. Uh, Once you get to hip hop in the 80s, it was definitely a lot that was more so reflective of of what happened in in the neighborhood versus not as much about the racism side as much. It still pointed that out sometimes, but you had, of course, you had X-Clan, Public Enemy, who would do that in the late 80s. But before that, you would have uh, Grandmaster Flash, Furious Five doing the message. So with those type of songs, it kind of gave an observation of what they saw, you know, in their neighborhood, the injustices, and just kind of kind of the result of what racism kind of led to, but always kind of, always trying to find a way to get out of it. So I feel like it's always been a good mirror and a reflection of what's going on. Recently, when it came to like the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, you would have songs from like Anderson Pack. He had a song called Lockdown, which was talking about everything from the riots and the looting that was going on to to the, uh, the Freddie Gray and the Trayvon Martin type cases. So it's always been a huge reflection to me, especially uh, especially recently with hip hop. Yeah, and and I mean, even just to continue and, and, and echo those sentiments, I, I feel like a lot of the music that, you know, um, we hear now derives from the things that are, are ancestrally we've, we've come to know. Um, and I would say that uh, if you've ever been to, to Ghana in December or um, been to the continent, you know, that, that like you, cool. it, it's, a, it's a party, but you hear all types of music and you kind of, you kind of see where all of those um, those same spirituals that Artistic was talking about um, derive from, and even those instruments, oh. the same instruments that are wow. 
uh, you know, we we use today. You're seeing the the early the earlier versions of that being used in a completely different way from when even our ancestors used it. So it's a mm-hmm. constant evolution um, of how we're communicating and how we're passing down knowledge um, through music, through the instruments that we use, through the techniques um, that are being used. Um, so it's it's actually super intricate in how we're uh, I want to say spreading that message. Um, not just in the U.S., but just across the world. Yeah, I guess when I think about like Black music and like a historical context, I always think it's like always been an avenue for hope and like finding like light in a dark place. And I think like most recently, like um, during like all the protests during 2020 and George Floyd, like I know one thing that like stands out to me the most from those protests was like the music. Like I just remember like everyone walking down the street with like, you know radios and like their iPhones and like people dancing and people singing and rapping and obviously like you know songs like all right kind of became like a protest anthem at um mm-hmm. during those moments so like to me just being in that space in those environments like it always just felt like during a moment of like you know tragedy and tension like we always find a way to come back to music as like a celebration of life and finding um you know some light Uh, when it's necessary and I think also just seeing so many people kind of like come together um, around music in this moment was like something that just sticks out to me I think is like pretty reflective of every decade that we've had um, and the way black people have used music so yeah that that is so good oh yes oh let me know if someone else is trying to add something I want to make sure I don't stop your hustle (laughs) Okay. No, I, I I love that you said that, and also the mention of Detsy December. Let me try not to make this a party right now. I want to go so bad. Yo, let's go. Having you need to. Okay, December. This December is the time. I'm saving up my coins to make sure I'm able to go. But um, I think Gabrielle, you made a a beautiful point about music being a celebration, um, a celebration of life. And so I want to pass this next question to DJ Artistic. Um, Still speaking about the historical references, historically, and also knowing that you teach music history as well. Feel free to share more about that. Okay, but how do yeah. you think music, yeah, how do you think music can be used to support social justice and resistance movements, number one? And then also, how have you incorporated this into your sets and events? Because obviously, you know, we go to events for the vibes. <laughs> but the in addition to that, it really, yeah, it really is a, a, a moment just to uplift our values and to uphold our values. For you, I'm curious to hear what your perspective is on that. So I would say when it comes to um, the way that we can use music is because um, a lot of times it's not just about DJing at actual clubs and parties, because it, of course, there are moments in the party where you can kind of use a social justice type of song. But a lot of times I've, I've done events such as I think it was the 50 year anniversary of the uh, March on Washington. And with that, mm-hmm. it was where even just like setting up the music for that, it was like, what songs should we play to, to get people out? Because uh, the thing about about uh, we have a wide array of music, so it's like we have the songs that are on the side of we shall overcome, but then we have the ones on the other side which are like ain't no stopping us now. So it's like a lot of times it's about what type of vibe you want to set. If you want to set a vibe where you where you want the people to kind of feel emotional and to feel like um, you know to kind of be in their feelings, you might play play one that's more on the we shall overcome or even like a a dark one like um, I won't say it's dark, but like yeah, Donny Hathaway. Um, Someday we'll all be free. Like that, that one's a kind of a heavy song, I would say, more than dark. It's, it's a very heavy song. So with that one, you wouldn't want, want to play that one if you try and make it a joyous type moment. But if you want it to, to be a reflective moment where people are emotional, you might need that type of uh, that type of song. Whenever you want it to be more upbeat, uh, you might go more on the side of a, of a um, celebratory type song. And on the in-between, it might be a what's going on type song, or even like some of the Michael Jackson type songs that, that he has. So. Mm-hmm. It could be used in different ways with that. And uh, the second part of the question, uh, you asked about how do I incorporate that? You said with uh, within class. With within your class set, yeah, you. I think you answered within your set and events, but even in yeah. the classroom, I, that's a powerful one you can share too. Yeah, I would say so. Whenever I teach certain classes, um, I always make sure to highlight that the hip hop and and R and B were not just always about you know romance or about partying because that's mm-hmm. been a big a big part of it. Because even and I would say that in the previous eras, you had a lot more diversity with that, with these artists, because as I mentioned, Marvin Gaye and, 
and uh, Stevie especially, like, of course, most of their things were about love, but they had whole albums that were, that were dedicated to social justice. So I feel like a lot of artists did actually dedicate their life to it and want to highlight the struggle as well. And and um, even even recently, uh, it's been it's been certain songs that kind of highlight that. And even like Black Eyed Peas had um, "Where Is the Love." So even songs like that that were big pop hits, they were still you know looking looking at it from a certain angle. Even that Jetty Kiss Why. So I, I highlight a song like that because that song came in 04, right when everything was about kind of G Unit, Dipset, and and uh, the crunk movement, but within within that era, it was still on 106 and Park. It was top five every single week for a good month or two. And he was asking about George Bush and the Towers. I can't, I don't want to repeat what he said, but if you know the song, you know what he said. So that's the way I see it. Yeah, that's good. Oh, no, that's that's really good. And what I'm what I'm also seeing is that music is a form of empowerment as well. Um, but let's also be clear music has become a, or is a very male dominated industry so i do want to pass this next question to gabrielle as we sure. know as the 50th anniversary of hip-hop approaches um and with this industry being so male dominated gabrielle i do want to know can you share your thoughts on the progress that has been made towards gender equality in this industry and Obviously, we can't have this conversation without talking about gender equality. So I want to start there, Gabrielle. Um, what kind of progress have you seen over time? Yeah, uh, so much to say about this topic. Um, I guess like to start off, I think from like the artist side, like obviously, like I don't recall a time where we've had like this many women in rap and like running it at the same time, like respectively, mm -hmm. just like killing it across the board. And so mm -hmm. I think um, on one hand, it's like, you know, there's obviously some um, closing the gap that's happening there. I think also like a lot of women who are like out and like going to parties, like they want to hear this music. Like, you know, I think usually, typically you go to, you go to a club and there's like all this like testosterone and men kind of like congregating over like meat mill and you know, all of that. But now it's like, yeah. it's just totally like shifted. And it's like, definitely like, I think you can tell there's like a definitely empowerment moving happening on like the music front. And then also just as a listener. Um, but I think like just behind that, if we start talking about like actually making the music, so like songwriters and producers, like, I don't think we've done anything to move the needle. Um, mm. I think there's like, um, a study that came out, I, I went to USC, so I'm, I'm always like reading stuff that comes out like studies and research. And so Annenberg did a study with Spotify about just like women in music and like how it has progressed over the past decade or so. And I think they said that like, only 13% of women are actually like accounted for as like a songwriter just off the like top billboard 100 over the last decade. And then when you start talking about producers, it's like it drops down to three to 4%. So, I mean, to me, it's like, we're, we're not doing enough in terms of just like elevating and like putting more women in positions to like, you know, be music engineers and like producing and songwriting and just like giving them opportunities to actually like create that music and create hits. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, I, I think it's like visually and like on a music level, like we definitely are making progress as far as like the artist side, but in terms of just like people who are actually like making responsible for making the music, um, we definitely like still think, I think we need a lot of work. Um, I think also just as far as like being a DJ, like I would definitely say like, there's a lot more women that are DJing now mm -hmm. than versus then like, I think when I started. So um, I started DJing about seven seven years ago so I'm like in my seventh year and I, when I first started you know there was only like a few women that I could kind of go to and like get advice most of the people that I was talking to were men but now it's just totally shifted you know there's like a lot of women that are DJing um and so I think that's also good just to see more representation but um I do think that like women are still dealing with like you know everything that comes with just being a woman in a male-dominated industry just even from my own experiences like you know being like partially critiqued at everything um you know the things you wear to gigs is like a big thing mm -hmm. like showing too much skin you won't get taken seriously like you're not showing enough skin it's like people are like what are you doing so um I don't know I think it's, it's a little tough on that aspect but if anything it just taught me to like have tougher skin and really hone in on like the technical side um like I made sure when I started learning how to DJ I was like I don't care what anybody says no one will ever be able to tell me 
that I cannot DJ on a turntables. And that mm-hmm. was just like really important to me. And, you know, now equipment has like advanced. And so you don't necessarily need that in order to become a DJ. But I think for me, it was just very important because I knew that going into it, like, you know, DJing started on turntables. And so, and if I wanted to like be respected as a DJ and especially as a woman, then I needed to make sure that not only did I know how to DJ on turntables, but I understood like, all equipment. And so I would never be in a position where I was around a bunch of men um, or a lot of male DJs and anybody would, you know, kind of be able to talk about me in a negative aspect in terms of like me not being on top of my, my game. So. Yeah, absolutely. So one, it sounds like I'm about to put some time on your calendar. If we're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Please do. Yes, helping upcoming women DJs. Listen, I will be sliding into your inbox very oh, soon. Do it. I love it. <laughs> and then I, I do kind of w- want you to, to dig in a little more about how do you hope to further contribute to that progress? Because if we're saying that, so from your point of view, there has been progress with women artists, which it might feel like the whole entire music industry has made progress, but yet the people who are responsible for putting it out and the distribution, they they are part of that impact and influence as so well. Gather all the feedback sort of further, from all the different people. And, then and that's I where further, so let's go ahead and put people on. Yes, there we go. Love to see it. <laughs> and so that is what further impacts the Black community, right? So I'm, I'm curious to know, just like, you know, really quick, if you can dig into how do you hope to further that progress um, in addition to the challenges that, you, that you've overcome by one, make sure you learn how to do the, tur- the turntables. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to hear that. I think just always being like in a space of like being able to uh, for people to come to me, like other women who either want to start DJing or are already DJing and just making sure that I'm like always available for like advice or tips. Um, That's happened like a few times. Like I've had like a lot of younger women who are like interested in DJing or like people that refer them to me. And like, I'm just always like there to like give everything I know, advice, tips. Um, I would love to also like move into a space of like, you know, beyond mentoring, like teaching. I would love to, I'm just going to put that into the universe. Like it would be like a dream to kind of like work with younger women and just like fully teach them like everything from like marketing yourself as a DJ, like learning the skills, um, you know, everything from like understanding like music and keys and BPMs. Um, so yeah, I think that's like the space that I want to continue to move in just beyond like giving people advice and being available for that advice, um, just to kind of like move more into a role of mentorship. Cause I think that's honestly how you change it is like a lot of younger women are starting to see themselves like represented, like on the music side in in terms of like the artist side, but I think it's important for them to see representation on other side, like producers, DJs, Mm -hmm. writers, um, you know, seeing, I think the more you see it and the more you realize that it is actually like achievable and I can do this and I can make this like a career um, is like really important as far as representation. So I think that's like kind of how you start to like shift it a little bit. Yeah, that's good. DJ Artistic, did you want to add anything to that? I I know you're even big up by saying, "Mm mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, uh, two things real quick, um, even with DJs. Yeah. So just like what, what Gabrielle is saying is just like earlier today, uh, it's a gig that I can't do next week. So I, uh, the, the, the promoter asked if I can have somebody cover it. So my first recommendation was a woman DJ. And his response was that he has he, he has a woman already. but So he wants it to be two men and two men and one woman. And I'm thinking, like, what does it matter if they're dope? If the first one I'm giving you is a woman, go with her because. You wanted me, if I'm telling you the closest thing to me as a woman, go with her. But it's still a lot of sexism with that. So that's one thing. And for two, earlier today, I was reading an article from about a, a lady named Drew Dixon. I never heard of her before. She was an A&R with Def Jam and back in like 94. She's the one who really produced the uh, Method Man and Mary J. Uh, uh, You're All I Need. So with that, she mm-hmm. was saying that um, she presented the idea because the song was just a skit. It was just like four bars. And with that, she, she went to Russell Simmons and said, hey, make this a whole song. And uh, I have a friend named Lauren Hill who can sing on it. And he said, who the hell is Lauren Hill? I don't know who she is. So he said, maybe get somebody like Mary J. Blige. So she called Puffy and she produced the song basically, but got no credit for it. So even 20, what, 29 years later, I'm just not learning who she is from an article. So it just shows that, especially in that era, uh, a lot of women were contributing, but didn't get credit for it. So hopefully mm-hmm. we can make a change with that for sure. 
Yes. No, that's that's big. I'm I'm glad you added that perspective. It's it's giving advocacy. And I honestly, I, I really, I really love to see it. Um, thank you for that contribution. And I do, Zane, I, I know you've been a little quiet. I'm, I'm coming right to you I'm right now. Conversation. <laughs> I'm just enjoying the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The thing, I, I love Zane's joy is, is incredible in our preparation for the, for, sure. for the conversation. He was like, look, y'all can ask me anything. And I was yeah. like, oh, word. Okay. Actually, get to it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Again, as y'all know, this is the 50th anniversary of hip hop. And y'all, I, I want some questions in the chat. Give me some energy in the chat or give me some questions. <laughs> give, me, give me something yeah. to work with, for sure. Yeah. Um, but I do believe that um, Kendrick Lamar appeared on this list. Uh, Billboard and Vibe did a top 50 hip hop artists. And Kendrick Lamar, I think, was number two on it, mm -hmm. which is major so mm -hmm. Zane as everyone may or may not know has worked with Kendrick Lamar so I want to know about your approach to collaborating with him and his team to create that look and feel and tone for Spotify's top five um, so let's go ahead and, and start with that how yeah. did you approach that collaboration um uh Kendrick if, if you know Kendrick and you know um PG Lang you know that Kendrick is creative off like just things that you can't even think about he is thinking about on a daily um so it, his creative team is also it would only you know be right that his creative team is also the same way so i think when um we wanted to i wanted to make sure that we have a conversation about music i think we you know us as um black people in in, in spaces like i think we always have the conversation whether it be in our home or in our uh, barbershops or salons, we talk about, well, what's Beyonce's top five albums? What's Kendrick's top five albums? What's this? What's that? Right. So it's like having an actual space where we can, um, we, we can have people and fans declare, nah, this is Kendrick's top five. And he was just coming off of um, a release, uh, the Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. It was about to be the 10th anniversary for um, Good Kid Mad City um, last year. Right. So which is an, another yeah. I, I, iconic record. Um, right. And we really talked about colors. We talked about which songs we wanted to highlight, which albums we wanted to highlight. And it was really a lot of uh, uh, back and forth that they, they really wanted to be creative. They wanted to make sure they were speaking to their fan base in a certain way. So um, going over copy with uh, Dave Free and, and, and that whole PG Lang, um, having communication with with them on that and, and and kind of shipping it out has been was that was a process in itself um and they were really cool uh I, I really enjoyed the experience you know we we were we were joking about what his favorite album was and i believe I, i'm not as a recorder i ain't gonna say what his favorite album was but i know what my favorite album was <laughs> um i know what my, my favorite album was and i i really enjoyed allowing um and just seeing people um put and uplift hip hop in that way. Like they remember when Good Kid Mad City dropped, they remember exactly what they were, like where they were, what they were doing, what they were wearing. Um, and they remember how um, pivotal uh, Pimba Butterfly was. Um, it was, came at a crazy time when, you know, it was just, uh, I feel like America was finally getting to really see the injustices that we've had to live through um, time and time again. And he, that was a political album. You know, we were talking about, um, we're talking about, you know, albums that that came out that are truly pivotal and speak to the current times. Um, to, 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 to Pimp a Butterfly is a, a cultural and political piece um, that speaks to the times and nuances of not just Kendrick, but everything that he's seen within his neighborhood, everything that we're seeing within our own neighborhoods um and the conversations that we, we may be having the things that we we may do to tune out certain things unfortunately because it's just so there's so much going on so that's just a compilation of that and then you know you you have to his next album after that is is damn you have to balance it out it's like you know we he, he wanted to uplift and celebrate like yo this is where we're at now um, i'm moving forward he i think he had just had his kid um, so it's like there, there are certain things and things in, in, in life that you're seeing with this top five. It, it really shows a, a, 
the history of Kendrick and the growth through through each and every album. So it was it was a fun project for sure. Yes, no, that's that's really dope. And I think that definitely having that balance is super important because as we know, and you all have heard a hundred million times that black folks were not a monolith. And so you're gonna you're gonna hear and see the different sides of us and who we are as it relates to resistance and a joy for sure. Um and so for everyone, I, I do want to hear in your opinion, um, and I know that we have about 15 minutes left yeah. for this conversation. I do want to leave a little bit of time. I want to leave a little bit of time for you to ask questions. Fly by. Yeah. Yes, it really did fly, fly by. Um, so in your opinion, in talking about today, who are some of the voices that are shaping um shaping music and shaping culture today? And and why do their voices matter as we think about it relating to resistance and joy? I would love to go. Um, yes. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I got a slew of people. Y'all conversation. And I just feel yeah. like I, I, I just feel like there's um, the biggest thing in music, in my personal, um, uh, like my personal opinion, is visibility, right? In, in anything, as as far as any creative, I'll always say that visibility. There's so many dope creatives that I know, so many dope producers, engineers, musicians. It's just visibility. There's just people it's just hard to be seen um but i think there are certain curators who are allowing them uh, certain mentors and curators who are allowing um people to cut through and uh people like yan sneed um who is i believe r&b at pandora um there are people like alasia uh head of r&b at, at, at spotify who are just like championing emerging mm -hmm. Um, artist Carl is also putting on young, um, fresh uh, rappers and 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 women, men and women in hip hop um, on the daily, taking those recommendations, doing the looking like where no one else is looking, and like those are the things that kind of help push the culture forward, push music forward, right? We want to see the progression of hip hop from um, the stuff from the '90s to when Lil Wayne had his run. There's a there's a in between, you know, and people who helped lead that progression um, to find, you know, the producers who are going to move the music forward and move the needle forward. Um, but yeah, that's that's my personal. Sure. And feel free to drop those names in the chat too, so we can look up these folks. Always on this music discovery journey for sure. You're gonna answer, DJ. All the time. Well, You're well, asking the. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Gabrielle, go ahead. Oh no, no, no. Yeah. I because you were about to say something. You okay. <laughs> anyone? Oh, yeah, I guess in terms of like, I guess the music front, um, obviously, I, I'm a huge Kendrick fan. I think he's always doing something super innovative and uh, very creative. But I think in terms of like, I don't I don't know, I would say representation, like something that I've never seen until recently, like within the last few years is having a black queer man as a rapper and like dominating the game Lil Nas X like I think that was huge for hip-hop in general just like to have someone openly out and gay and being proud of it and like inspiring you know the younger generation to like be comfortable with themselves um I love how he responds to critics as well so um I don't know like I don't know a lot of people would classify him as like pop he does rap it's it's the same I don't know I think it's a, it's a form of expression at this point but I think that you know that could potentially lead other people to kind of like be comfortable and be in a hip-hop space where we've never had that before and um you know being proud of that um I also just love people who just shake shit up and do different stuff and I love Doja Cat for that reason mm -hmm. um you know that. people are always arguing like is she pop is she rap and I think that's the yeah. great thing yeah. is like she yeah she's like she can rap her ass off yeah. and she can also make a hit pop record and she's right. still talented and dope and creative and I just love that everything she's putting out is just like so far in the future that I feel like a lot of people are like trying to catch up to her um and so I just think she's dope I love what she's doing and like what she represents in terms of her artistry so um that would probably be like my second. Um, I also love like Tyler, the creator. I think he's like another dope rapper that's just doing something way out there and different. I love his music. So yeah, I typically love the people who just like don't follow what everyone else is doing in rap and just do something way out there. Um, Cause then it sets a trend and then people are like 
trying to jump on it. And so I love the innovators. Oh, for sure. Yeah. The, the first one I was going to say was Doja Cat. Yeah, Doja Cat, definitely. Because um, funny enough, because I, I even asked a few weeks ago, a few weeks ago about her being a, if she classified as a West Coast rapper because she's from L.A. technically. And half the responses which were from men were saying, well, she's not a rapper, she's pop. And I said, well, technically, she raps more than most of these new rappers, because a lot of new rappers are more more melodic rappers who sing half the time anyway. So just because she has pop songs where she's singing doesn't mean she's not a rapper because Lil Wayne has made pop songs and even Lil Baby and them have too. So a lot of times that goes back to kind of the sexism where I feel like she should be classified as a rapper because she can rap and she can rap better than a lot, a lot of men can too. So yeah. for sure. Yeah, that's good. And I I, so I want to think about, so we talked about the historical references and the present, those who are shaping the um, culture and even the music industry today and really being representatives of Black resistance, but also Black joy. And I also want to look at the future. Like we we can't ever have this conversation without talking about the future as well. And so Zane, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start that one with you. I'm curious to know, because you you also believe in investing in the next generation, Yes. How has hip hop shaped you and prepared you to commit to empowering the next generation of creatives? And how do you even see the industry evolving? I know these are some long questions. Oh, no, uh, sure. I I'll, I'll try to do my yeah. best to keep this answer short because I know we're, we're on a time limit. Um, so I'm a music producer as well as um, a, a marketing creative. Um, I've had mentorship get me to this particular point where I'm sitting down um, in Atlanta talking to you all um, about music, right? It, this only happens if someone um, pays it forward. And that's the one thing that we have to continue to do. I'm seeing it more in, in hip hop and the music industry for sure. Um, but my motto in life is to allow people to get twice as far in half the time, you know, to make new mistakes. People should be able to make new mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. um, I should be able to get where I'm at right now in this conversation. And if I'm going to go, I'm actually talking to some younger creatives after this, I should be able to talk to those creatives and or those musicians and say, hey, look, this is what you have to do. This is where I failed. You're not going to fail this way because I'm going to tell you how to bypass it, but you're going to go on and you may make a new mistake. And that way you're going to go take that information, pass it down to the next person. So it has to, it has to keep happening that way, right? Um, we can't, we can't come from a place of lack. It has to come from a place of abundance. There's room for everybody, right? So I, why, why would I hold this information and in? I should be allowing myself to teach the next generation how to continue to grow and continue to move the needle. Yeah, well, that's good. That's so, good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I so I also see some questions in the chat and I'm going to specifically assign them to some of my amazing panelists. So, Gabrielle, this one's for you because we have a question from Damon Journey. Let me know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. You can put the phonetic spelling if you like. So, Gabrielle, <laughs> so how do we help our non-Black colleagues? Because as we know, this is, you know, we live on a, a melting pot of a planet. Um, how do we help them? And their friends truly appreciate the message and meaning in our music, not just to enjoy the surface, which is like the beats and the sounds, without preaching or alienating them. Very interesting. So what would you say to Devon? That's a really good question. Um, because you know, I don't I don't know. I can't speak for everyone. I know for my myself, it can be a little exhausting to kind of constantly feel like you're in a teaching position. Um, but I, I guess it's, it's a kind of a two way thing, like, you know, being able to provide that historical context is also redirecting people. There's so many documentaries, really good documentaries on Netflix, Hulu, books that are available that kind of, you know, really go deep into hip hop history and understanding our music and understanding where it comes from and it coming from a place of pain and celebration and um, just being having fun you know I think I saw someone earlier comment on like how in the past like a lot of our music was used to like you know make a statement or um you know comment on like political and uh cultural 
moments that the Black community were going through. And now it's kind of transitioned to like more of a fun thing. But I think that's the best part about hip hop is like, there's always that duality of like, we can have fun and we can turn up and then we can also just get really serious and like talk yeah. about things that are like really affecting our community. And so I think it's just about um, being open to receiving um, and understanding that it's not just about what people see all the time and like media and um, you know some of like the negative aspects of hip hop at the core of it it's really just about celebrating us as a people and celebrating you know how far we've come and like how much further that we can go just off of this art like honestly like just being able to provide so many opportunities um, on just musicians artists songwriters producers um so I, I don't know. I guess it's like it's it's kind of like being open to that information, to receiving that information. Also, you know, being open to being a teacher. Some people need a little bit of guidance, a little bit of push, but also not feeling responsible to that and holding that weight, um, because I think there is enough information out there to kind of like educate yourself um, and come up to speed and then, you know, really just appreciate it, go back in time. Like, I think we started talking about that in terms of like history, like going back and getting deep and looking up um, some of this music and listening to it um, and understanding it from that perspective. Yeah, yeah that's that's very cool. good perspective because the reality is that Black sure. history is American history, which means there is. is information in abundance on Beyonce's internet. I think anyone, <laughs> anyone can find it. Let's keep You're it a bug. Right. So with the with the last, oh, he loves to answer. Oh, love to see hey. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if anybody else has, yeah, that was a good question. I don't know. That's, yeah. that's Yes. And I do also, I would love for the, the panelists to put where people can find you in the chat as well. And I'm going to throw this last question to DJ Artistic before I give it back to Sequania and I think Brittany, y'all let me know. But DJ Artistic, this one's for you. Very yeah, specifically. Yeah. Very long question. So I'm going to uh, use chat GPT with my mind. So you okay. spoke earlier about the content of hip hop and how it's evolved over time, what's going on in, in the, in the um, neighborhoods to racism to general experiences. And so we still have those artists pretty much weave those topics effortlessly in the art that they put out. So for you, and I'm sure you read that question, DJ Artistic, so you have the, yeah. the whole just All right. yeah, yeah. How do you feel about this next phase of hip hop? And what excites you about these newer artists? So I would say the thing about hip hop is that it kind of comes uh, in waves where I would say the last time that like political p p political and like like truly social conscious, socially conscious rap was really dominant, dominant, was probably the late 80s, early 90s. I would say around that X clan Public Enemy, even... I wouldn't say tried and that I saw were really uh, politically conscious in, in that way, but in that era, you had a lot of those artists making like number one hits. But since then, it's kind of been a, a combination of every once in a while, lyricism is kind of the emphasis. So I would say late 90s was kind of the peak of like high level lyricism. That's when like Eminem first came out. That's when Jay Z first started to really blow up at that level. And then I feel like since then, it's been kind of a combination. So with them mentioning Kendrick, uh, No Name, Joy Badass, I feel like um, at this point, I think there's definitely space for everything. I feel like as a DJ, I actually do need, uh, I can't say need, but I do prefer that there's a lot more celebratory type music. I feel like because aside from the lyrical raps that, that, that were mentioned and then the City Girls, Ice Spice and uh, Meg The Stallion type of party rap, you have this kind of slow drugged out rap. You have this kind of like murderous shoot up the club rap. And that's what I'm personally tired of. I'm tired of because a lot of those songs get big in the club and it's like they only work with certain types of crowds. And even with those crowds, I don't want to bring that type of energy to it because it's like if someone, as Gabrielle said earlier, a lot of times it's about those songs where the guys can kind of get together and rap along and feel like they're drug dealers and all this, whether they are or not. They might work corporate, but they feel like a dope boy for that minute. But I do. Uh, I feel like we have a lot more space for uh, the, especially the women who have the kind of the dancing songs and just upbeat music that's just more 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 of a fun type vibe and there's some artists who could do both i feel like it doesn't really have to be separate even though we do kind of somebody might see the city girls as being supposedly basic i guess when it comes to lyricism but to me a lot of them because even like meg the stallion i feel like she can actually rap great is this that she does focus on making you know songs that are about you know about whether it's about sex party and twerking but i don't have any issue with any of that i feel like at this point uh there's enough space for everything 
whatever you're into, you can find it. You can go on Spotify, YouTube, whatever it is, and find whatever is out there. And I'm just excited to see more upbeat party music. I feel like it's just, it's become too depressing the last couple of years and the last five, six years. A lot of it is just so slow and morbid. So I'm yeah. just trying to evolve past that part. Yes. Oh, I love it. I love it. Let's let's be clear about Queen Meg. Let's be clear, yeah. let's be clear about Queen Meg. <laughs> Honestly, I see it as empowerment music. Even with the um, yeah. one of her most recent albums, what is it called? Uh, Trauma Zine. My mm-hmm. memory is not yeah. serving me well right now. But she really she talks about her anxiety and depression. Um, and there's another piece of it that's empowerment as well. Yes, thank you, Jordan. That's good. Yeah. And so I, I definitely think that artists are being a lot more diverse with what they put out. And you know, yes, we are getting tired of the trap music. Come on now, like we need yeah. we need the celebratory music for sure. But I I want to thank you, DJ Artistic Zane. And Gabrielle for this amazing conversation where we talked about the historical reference of, of, of Black joy when we thought about on Saturday mornings when we had to wake up to clean. You know, once you hear that music, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. <laughs> clean this house, wash these dishes, right? And then it's oh, also yeah. the celebration of life when it comes to worship music and church. Um, and then we think about now the, the artists who are kind of shaping shaping today, which is like Kendrick Lamar. I know somebody says something about Queen Glorilla. All right, I got you. I, <laughs> you. I heard you. I see you. <laughs> and we're also talking about the future of music as well and the artists and the people who are also behind the scenes that are shaping culture and shaping those conversations today. Y'all really did that. Thank you for having me as your host for uh, for this conversation as well. I had a great time. I appreciate y'all. Follow me on Instagram, Makisha Noel. Yeah, yeah, I'll put it in the chat as well. Saquania, I'm going to pass it right back to you. Again, thank you for having me as your moderator. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you guys for having us. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you all so much for that. Thank you, Makisha, for leading that amazing dialogue. Thank you. DJ Artistic, DJ Gabby, Love. <laughs> I've been so, I'm going to make a quick joke right now. So Brittany has been like, girl, that's not her name. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I say that, but no. Um, thank you, Gabby, for being here. Thank you, Makisha. Thank you, Zane. Thank y'all for holding space with us. Um, this has been the Rhythm of Resistance. And before you all leave, please also take a look at this QR code here, where, as we spoke about earlier, this is a really dope community school in the area known as Bedside Brooklyn, historically Black, historically dope, um, and historically responsible for putting out amazing people into the world to take us into the future of hip hop, the future of music, the future of art, creativity. Um, and all things we need to continue thriving in joy. Um, So thank you again. And you all have a wonderful remainder of your evening. And don't forget to scan this QR code and to make a donation. We're going to play some music to walk us out. We got one minute left. Play play the let out. What's going on with the let out? That's that's a Florida term there to let out. <laughs> that's a that Florida term. Florida. You're using that in Philly. Philly say it too. I first heard it when I was out there in Florida because I didn't hear it. I'm in LA. working on yeah. it. Okay. I'm working on it. It's playing and y'all can't hear it. So oh, please forgive Let's me. He said okay. parking lot pimping. <laughs> yeah, parking lot pimping. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. Yes. Can y'all still see my screen? Oh, we definitely I can. can still see your screen. Yeah. All right, dope. Let me see. Go ahead and add All your show screen. notes. <laughs> <laughs> all my what all your show notes my we got show? 17 people still still in the group they trying to get catch still before they, <laughs> okay before they go okay. back to work Word. walk, okay. walk out music <laughs> 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 location hype over there i see it Get it going though, hey. I can't. Yep, got to. Gotta put it together. (laughs) Ooh, ooh. Okay, people coming coming out. They coming back. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Ooh. 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 Brittany, let's get that energy up.
Yeah. There we go. There we go. Ooh, I hear you, MC. I hear you, MC. A little bit. Got to throw some, some MC on top. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yo, 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 yo,